Things have changed. We've got a new generation today. The public school system has become completely secular. No longer do they pray. No longer do they read the Bible. No longer do they try to teach the kids anything spiritual. We've got organizations in this country now that actively work against the gospel. They actively work against the preaching of the Word of God. They actively work against the Ten Commandments or anything that has to do with Christ. They try to take down the manger scenes in the wintertime and all of that. This group, Freedom From Religions, one of them, and others, they are dead set to get the name of Christ out of the public venue if they possibly can. And of course, what's left if that happens? Nothing but secularism. And I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. Look at France and look at some of these countries over there in Europe and you'll see what secularism does. It destroys the people. The problem is that Christianity is not an institutional thing. It's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I, I believe that the heart of man, the hunger and the soul of a human being reaches up to somebody that's a lot bigger than us. And if you want to know God, you can know God. A lot of people, they don't really want to know him. They just want somebody to grab to and complain about. They're part of the church, you know, and they're part of the Christian culture. And we have cultural Christianity, and everybody's a Christian around here. And you know how that goes. They're drunk one day and praying the next. Are you a real believer? Are you a real believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? You may be going to one of the most apostate churches on the face of this earth. You may be going to a church that denies the virgin birth, the blood atonement. They deny the inspiration of the scripture. They deny every cardinal doctrine that we believe. But you're not saved by that church. You're saved by Christ. And if you'll call upon his name, he'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And then if you start growing in the Lord, you'll get out of that place. When you start fellowshipping with the Lord and you start to learn something, you'll find out the people around you are twice dead and plucked up by the roots. And it won't take you long to separate yourself and you'll find brethren who love the Lord. Now that's just the way it is. So when the Bible says here that these people which knew not the Lord, it's talking about a whole generation. The book of Joshua chapter 24 and verse 31 says this, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Then in chapter 17 of Judges in verse 6 it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's called anarchy. And what is that, preacher? Anarchy is when every man has his own law. There is no law. And that's what it's coming to in this country. Anarchy. So there's no law. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. The Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd that laid his life down as the chief shepherd, the greatest of all the shepherds, and the great shepherd who's going to come again at the second advent. He led the way. He went through the darkness. He went into the grave and came out of the grave. He was baptized in the Jordan. He went down in typology into what all that death could do. And then he came up out of death. It couldn't hold him. He led the way. So my chief shepherd is going to come again. And when he comes, he's going to lead the way. He's going to lead his dear children along. I'm glad for that tonight. He said to the children of Israel, he said, you're peculiar people to me. He said, you're different. He said, you're not going to be like the Canaanite. You're not going to be like the Hittite. You're not going to be like the Perizzite and all the rest of them. He said, you're my people. You're a chosen nation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. He said, a royal priesthood. He said, you're a priesthood. This whole nation is. God said by saying that to these people, I have given you great privilege and great authority, but with that comes great blessing. And he blessed them. He promised them no sickness. He promised them that no army could stand before them. He promised them that he would go before them. He would go before them and he would open the way. And all they had to do was follow him. They knew all of this before Joshua died. They'd been told this. They'd been promised this. The last thing that Moses said before he passed from this world, he reminded the children of Israel that they had been brought into a covenant relationship with the Lord. That they had been brought into a relationship with Jehovah, Almighty God. And that he reminded them that you're not like everybody else. You can't be like them. You may try to be like them, but you can't be like them. You're different people. And here you are today, a royal priesthood. Every one of us in this house tonight, if you're born again, I don't care how much you try, you can't go back to where you came from. You may try it for a while, but if he knows you and you know him, he'll leave the 99 and he'll go find that bleeding sheep caught on the rocks.
Aren't you glad for that? My sheep know my voice and they hear me and a stranger they'll not hear. He'll come after you folks. Why don't you just serve him tonight? It'll be so much easier. It'll be so much better for you to live your life for him, serve him, live for him. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty into God to the pulling down of strongholds. We're in a war, folks. It's warfare. It's all out war. No holds barred. Pull out all the stops. We are at war for our children. We are at war for our liberty. Yes, we are. We are at war. You realize that you're that close. All of us are in this house tonight. We're one heart a beat away from either hell or heaven. It's not a game, is it? Where I came from, they don't preach on hell and they don't preach on the new birth. Neither one. Folks, is the new birth necessary? What's the Lord talking about in John 3, Nicodemus? What did he say? What's, what's changed about that? Ye must be born again. What's he talking about in Luke chapter number 16? The Lord Jesus in Luke 16, he said, And the rich man lifted up his eyes where? In purgatory? No, it was not an intermediate state. He lifted up his eyes in hell. He said, I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him that not only can kill the body, but the soul in hell. I forewarn you. Fear him. Yet our churches today are so smart. They're so chick, so with it, so cool. You know, it's all about now. It's all about making you feel good. It's all about prosperity. What well, prosperity and all that feels good. I mean, after all, nobody likes being poor. Nobody likes being where you can't pay your bills. The Lord gave us all these texts over here about proving you. He said, I sent you manner to prove you. He said, I gave you the commandments to prove you. Over and over and over again, he said, I'm proving you. What do you mean, preacher? He's putting you to the test. He's showing you that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Does man live? Give him his part. Give him your life. With God, there is no difference between the rich and the poor, the bond and the free, the black and the white, the red and the yellow. It makes no difference. When it comes to salvation, the foot of the cross is as level as it can be. Job 42 says this, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now James comments on Job in the New Testament. And here's what James says about him. Chapter 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The end is what's important. Where will you be when you're 70 years old? Not where you are when you're 20. Where will you be when you're 70, if you live that long? Or you may be 90. Where will you be? That's your end. Whatever God gave you in the beginning will carry you to the end. Here's how you get there. Patience is one of the greatest virtues on this earth. It's like love. It's one of those things that a lot of people never really get a hold of. Patience. Wait on God. Give God an opportunity to do something in your life. Don't expect a push button immediate gratification. Are you turning your life over to the Lord tonight? Have you realized for the first time in your life, I need God? I made a mess out of everything. I've been through two, three, four, five marriages. I'm broke. I can't get a job. I've got some kind of a disease. And it may seem hopeless to you. But I want to tell you something tonight. The one that made everything there is, spoke it into existence, can take care of everything in your life. Just give him time. Patience. Patience is a virtue that builds and creates and shapes all the other virtues about your life. Patience.